Welcome everyone to a deck hockey focused special presentation, the 50 year history of organized street deck and ball hockey. In this episode, we're going to explore the 1980s, the golden age of deck hockey. Scott, what can we expect? In the 1980s, the expansion of our sport really takes off. Um, you start to see the, the major hockey hotbeds that we see today in New Jersey, Long Island, New York, um, Pennsylvania really start to enter the scene. And in addition to Ray LeClerc and Chris Hauser, you start to see these other influencers um, who drove our sport. The, the main one being Mark Madden out in Pennsylvania who would put his stamp on our sport over the next 30 years. Pennsylvania is synonymous with the game that we know today, but they were just as essential in the early years. Well, in Pittsburgh, it's kind of a, a brief synopsis. In the 70s, there were a bunch of leagues literally playing in basketball courts and tennis courts and gyms and playgrounds. And the two biggest of those were the Lower Valley Street Hockey League. That was in Springdale, PA. And uh, the team from there was called the Drop-In. And they were the first team to travel. They went to, to Sinking Springs, the, the Reading Deck Hockey Center, frequently. And there was also a league called the Penn Hill Street Hockey League. And uh, my team back then was the Etna Islanders. We played in both. And, and you're playing in tennis courts. You're playing on schoolyards. And then you're trying to go to tournaments to play in these Milek rinks with the different sticks and the different shin guards. And it was quite culture shock. And uh, eventually it boiled down to the Penn Hill Street Hockey League. All the teams kind of migrated there uh, to play again in tennis courts. But uh, the first deck rink was built in uh, 1985 or 86. I forget exactly which. That was the Penn Hills Deck Hockey Center, which is still around today as the uh, Greater Pittsburgh Deck Hockey Center. But now there's literally a couple dozen rinks in Pittsburgh. You know, some have been built by the Penguins as a community project, Project Power Play. So it's grown incredibly by leaps and bounds in Pittsburgh. But back in the day, it was just a bunch of guys playing with ice hockey gloves and ice hockey sticks and ice hockey shin pads in playgrounds. And I rather suspect that's how everybody started out in the game. Uh, now you have kids who don't even know what that's like. I think everybody on this call knows what that's like. And I think it's good that we did because that was the very organic version of the game. It, it was more violent, no doubt about that. Uh, the leagues I'm talking about started out as full checking leagues in the tennis courts. Uh, and, and as a result, when we got to play in the ranks and in the tournaments, you know, we didn't cry about every little perceived penalty, although a lot of us still did. But, uh, but, but that's basically the start. I, I suspect it's the same everywhere. But, uh, mm. you know, we, we played, you know, in, 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 in situations, in circumstances, on, on, on facilities that – Nobody would play in today unless they're in a town without a deck hockey rink. But, but I will say, I think in towns that don't have deck hockey rinks or indoor ball hockey rinks, I think that scenario still plays out today. I think in a lot of cities, there's still people playing exactly the way I described. But, but again, when the rink got built in 86 and a bunch of other rinks followed, it was culture shock because that game in the rink with the plastic sticks and everything was nothing like we'd ever played before. Just like the game today, tournament ball hockey, has no relation whatsoever to the game on the deck back then. It has been such a transformation and such an evolution over the years. It's, it's, if you explained it to somebody who wasn't involved, they would have a tough time following. The game was alive and well in Lemonster, and Ray Richards was one of the first class of youth to grow up under an established game. Well, I got to tell you, you know, I was very fortunate that you know, when hockey came around in Lumberster, it only came around in the in the 70s where, I mean, we were all baseball players. I remember playing baseball. I was a baseball player, and yeah. I wanted to be a major leaguer. I wanted to play baseball. And then this guy came around. Which his name was Bobby Orr. I'm sure you guys know that guy's name. <laughs> so uh, hockey started here in Massachusetts because of Bobby Orr. So we were started to play deck hockey in our backyards, in our gravel pits, and tennis courts and all that kind of stuff. We were, we were using, you know, real ice hockey sticks and stuff like that and pads and makeup and nets, all that kind of stuff. And then as it progressed, Milek Corporation actually built the rink practically in my backyard. So God is good. So it's like, you gotta be, you gotta be kidding me. I was one, I was one street away from the very first original street hockey center in Lemonster. And it was, 
a block away. And it's like, you got to be kidding me. So we played there every day, every day, every day. So it was hockey. And then the transformation from from where it was, we were playing with wooden sticks, breaking your sticks, and they get another breaking stick. And then along came Ray LeClerc, who developed this plastic blade. I'm not sure if you remember the plastic blade. You screw it on the, the bottom of your blade. You put the two screws in there, and you're ready to go. You take that old wooden hockey stick, and you slip it into that plastic blade, and you're ready to go. It was straight as an arrow. There was no curves. We all played with a straight stick. We made our own, we made our own nets. and and put foam pads on on your legs for the mag your, your, your for the pads we put on uh, magazines you tape those up so it started very premature from what it is today and our our leagues you know when we started our leagues on first street i was here at the beginning of time it was like you got to be kidding me and where that rink is where that rink was then if you were to go there today, you can still see the green paint on the asphalt where that parking lot was where we played. And it's, wow. I tell everybody, I said, you got to go see this. And they're amazed by seeing that green paint because we played on asphalt, which would, when it would rain, it was slippery as hell. You couldn't play. But we, we were there every day. So I saw the transformation from what it was from that first blade, I mean, the wooden blade to the plastic blade to the – to the airflow blade, all that kind of stuff, I lived yeah. through it. We see a similar story with Danny Broderick as the game takes root in Boston. Well, we played, um, I was about a year just out of high school in college, and a bunch of guys here from Everett, you know, we used to play at Hockey Town. Uh, we started a play up there on a Wednesday night, and um, we got playing, a bunch of us, and then there was other, you know, other guys coming in that, uh, we're putting a team from Lynn out in uh, Lemonster, and they asked, would you like to play? And it had nothing to do with the Seahawks. It was a team uh, at that time, I think it was called the uh, Not Shore Knights or something like that. And our first introduction to go out there was uh, we played in a Can-Am. And uh, it was funny. I think we were uh, we were like 2-0 and in our third game because of the goal differential back then. We had to beat a team like eight or nine, boy, eight or nine goals in order just to make the playoffs. So we got introduced to it and, uh, you know, of course, the elements, the rain, the, the snow, the wind and everything out there. Um, and it was it was great. It was, uh, you know, you could you could sense it was a different atmosphere than playing in a league. So uh, all of a sudden, then I, there was a guy named Richard Dooley who met I knew at Hockey Town and he was coaching the Seahawks at the time. And he said, would you like to play? And uh, that's how I got introduced. Uh, we went out there. Uh, uh, played in a tournament and I stayed with the team. He ended up leaving it. And then after that, for 30 something years, I ended up running it. And, uh, but I was like, Ray, I played semi-pro baseball for 10 years. I never, uh, you played hockey in the winter and baseball in the summer. I never even picked up a stick. And then when my arm went, it was hockey all the way around. So we got playing in the league at hockey town. And my mentor was Ray LeClerc. Uh, Cause after the first tournament I played in Lemon, so I got to meet him. Yep. And the one thing he emph emphasized to me was uh, a team that plays together uh, in the league, stays together, is usually a team that wins together. And that's what happened. We went up there and we started playing in the league with guys from different teams. We ended up putting a team in. And then eventually it was a team that we took the tournaments for a number of years. And um, it was great. I mean, we've traveled all over the world and everything. But that's basically how we got started, just a pickup game uh, around here. And then guys asking – to go up on a Wednesday night uh, to play hockey. And uh, some of those guys were just, we stayed in the league. And then we ended up recruiting through the league to make one, one good tournament team. But uh, yes. we, we, we always played in the league at Hockey Town. And I've been up there now for close to 44 years. With the game having an established foothold, Bill Walsh gives us a firsthand look into growing up with street hockey in New Jersey. Yeah, well, first I want to uh, go something with Ray said, the old screw on blades. In uh, our area, they were known as the Bobby Clark screw on blade. <laughs> and I remember my mom uh, yelling at me because she came in the kitchen the one time and I had her pasta pot with boiling water to curve the blade. And yep. that was like the only way you had to put it in boiling water and then step on it and turn it and put it back in the boiling water. Yep. And uh, she wasn't too happy with that. <laughs> but uh, the obviously it was the Broad Street Bullies, so hockey in this area was booming at that time. But again, like you said, it was on the 
you know, street and whatever. And when the first league started in the early 70s, checking was legal, fighting was legal. You had to have three fights in a game to get thrown out. And these were nasty people playing, you know. I was 12, 13 years old and keeping score with one of those big red cocks that had to, you know, to push down on front and back to stop it. So there was times I'd have six or seven guys on each side of me in there for fighting and they're fighting behind me in the penalty box, you know, and, and they're screaming at me, you know, what time do I get out? And I'm like, I got seven on each side. I have no, I, I got to wait for the, the ball to stop. They asked the referee when everybody gets out because it was mayhem. Uh, there was one guy at one point, I remember when I first started playing, I was sitting on the bench and it was a guy, that, his name was Draculus. And he never played, and I didn't understand why. And I, <laughs> I he told me he was going in for the next shift. And I, could, I lifted up his stick, and I was like, what the, what the hell are you doing? He soaked his stick in the, in the tub for like two days. And it was, you couldn't even use it to play. He went out, they dropped the ball, and he just ran straight at the goalie and cross-checked the goalie right across the face and just over the, over the net, caused a bench clear and brawl. The fans would stand on the side. We'd have literally 200 fans around the rink every game. And if you were playing, we had 10 town team rinks, so you had to go to each town to play. And the fans there, you'd be running by, and they'd actually hit you with a cowbell. I remember getting my, my eyes split open. I was running down the side of the boards, and one of the mothers swung a cowbell at me and hit me in the, in the face with a cowbell. And uh, it, was, it was mayhem. Mm -hmm. So the same thing, the, the, the league, you know, finally uh, Jack Swan started it, but you had to have a hometown rink. So we were young. I was 15. I was still with the Kings keeping score and stuff. They had to go to the township, and they, they paid the township $5,000 that we raised through selling tickets and stuff. They laid the asphalt. We had to buy all the boards and build the rink ourselves. So we painted uh, advertisement on the boards so we could build a rink for ourselves in 77, I believe it was. And uh, you had to pay for everything. When the refs came for every game, you had to pay them. You had to pay them your fine money for fighting. If you had a suspension, you get fined. And you had to pay all your money before they would even ref the game. If you didn't have a broom, it was a $10 fine because everything, the, the surfaces were so bad, the ball would get stuck in the corner and there'd be a two yeah. gap between the boards and you had to dig it out and that's why I think the South Jersey teams were so aggressive in the corners. Uh, well I remember when they did away with the, the full-on checking and fighting and I remember thinking no it's going to be such a lame league now. It was still just as brutal but we didn't have, we played a different offside you know we weren't used to the floating blue line we weren't used to the plastic there was no deck hockey anywhere around here until the mid 80s uh, not still the only rink, that coffee rink around here. So every game was played outside on either concrete or asphalt. And I remember going to Lemonster the first time and my jaw just dropped and seeing that facility. You know, it was just, it was, you slide, you guys know you slide on asphalt, you have a raspberry on your ass for two weeks. Mm -hmm. You know, and I got there and I could, you could slide, you could, you know, it was so fast and our, our, all our corners were boxed. They weren't rounded because we built them out of our, you know, we didn't know how to make round corners when we were building the rinks right. back then in the early 70s. So everything was boxed. So you couldn't wrap the ball around. Yep. So playing on rinks like that was, you know, just a completely different experience for us. If, was, I, if I can interject, uh, Scott, one thing, uh, and by the way, I played, I played way back when. And yep. I remember playing at Mont Ephraim against the Mont Ephraim Eagles. And the That's guy who hit me with the cowbell. A guy who I later got to be friends with, Joe Maxwell, who was a big defenseman for them. We had like a, a pretty boy type of guy on our team. And he said before the game started, hey, pretty boy, I'm going to kill you before the game's over. <laughs> and I, looked at, I looked at their bench and I go, well, thank God I'm not a pretty boy, huh? And they didn't laugh. <laughs> One guy spit at me. <laughs> Maxwell was a big dude. And he, he was, that's the rink I was telling you about where they swung cowbells at us. The surface was like an oil type surface. And you had to literally change the ball every like two or three shifts because you couldn't see the ball anymore. It was completely black. No one wanted to fall down because if you did, your jersey was ruined, your your pants were ruined, everything was ruined. And that that man Ephraim Rink and Maxwell, he was a tough dude too. Well, uh, I would be remiss too, and I know Ray remembers this. 
a big turning point in Pittsburgh uh, street hockey was in 1984 and 85. The Penguins and I uh, collaborated to put on two tournaments in the summer yep. uh, at the Civic Arena, the yep. Penguins home rink, yep. because it was very smooth concrete underneath. It was perfect for deck hockey. And uh, those were two huge tournaments. We had teams come from all over the place to yep. participate in those. And uh, that was a big turning point. It got on TV. Yep. It got in the papers. It got in a bunch of different magazines. The Penguins publicized it like crazy. So that was the beginning of getting the kind of push necessary to get street hockey on the map in Pittsburgh and ultimately to get the first rink built uh, at Penn Hills. Uh, Marty McSorley, who was with the Penguins, then played in the tournament. They were just two really, really big events and uh, came off perfectly. And, and two guys who were instrumental in that were uh, a guy named Paul Steigerwald, who at the time was the Penguins Director of Community Relations, but since then has become both a play-by-play -play and color commentator for the Penguins. And a guy named Joe Batista, who worked for the Penguins then, but later went on to become the head ice hockey coach at Penn State University. Uh, those events, Ray, I know you played in both those. Uh, they were huge. In fact, Ray, I think you were MVP at the first one. Yes, I was. memory yeah. serves. Those events were huge. Uh, great hockey, just uh, tremendous to watch and got a lot of publicity. Right. Okay. That, was, that was where the Penguins were playing too, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah the Igloo. That was the Penguins Arena, the Igloo. Yeah. Yeah, I remember the Igloo. Yep, I remember that. Two years in a row we went there. Yep. And then in, in, in National, the rinks we had in South Jersey were shoe boxes compared to even the deck rinks. When, when we built our rink in National Park for the Kings, it was the biggest rink in the league at the time. And it was uh, uh, 45 foot wide by maybe 115 foot long. Now, when we played in South Jersey, we played the blue line all side, regular all sides. Then when we went to some tournaments, it was a floating blue line or the red line all side. We were, it took us two or three games of a tournament just to get used to staying on side and not raising yeah. our stick for a, a pass. We were playing shorthand in the Can-Am one. We only let up in the whole tournament. We only allowed 12 goals and eight of them were shorthanded. In the NHL, we have long established original six rivalries. In our sport, no team is more polarizing than the Lemonster Rams. Well, the Rams, I was playing for a team out of Niagara Falls called the Griffins and then slash Team Canada. And by the third year, I was really hanging out, uh, 75, I'd been here an entire year. And I saw that the team from Lemister needed just a little bit of an edge. So the first time, I said, well, I uh, played for the Boucher Flyers. John Gee ran the team. And uh, I played against my old team. They were really, really mad, especially the Murrays, because we grew up a couple houses away, and, you know, we were always a unit since we were kids. But I kind of explained it to them over time, and, you know, it softened. So by 76... I wasn't going to play for Boucher Flyers anymore. I, I started with a team called the Lemister Rams. I started forming it in the fall of 75. And my goal with the team was to have a team that was going to travel. We were going to be tough at home, travel. I could count on getting other players and go to different, different things. So the very first tournament, we had lost to Rosendale in the final in 75. And we met them in the final in 76. And we beat them. So the Rams won. My uh, One of my best friends from Niagara Falls, Dave Qatar, uh, who ended up running our rink in Niagara Falls for 35 years. He was a great line mate, uh, best clutch player I ever saw. He scored the winning goal against Roslindale in overtime. Four weeks later, we ended up meeting my old team in the final. And he scores with five seconds left. We win that tournament. Three weeks later, we're down in New Jersey, and he scored the winning goal there. So the Rams had three wins. They were three for three. And we were starting to travel. By the by, that fall, we went to Ken White's Canada Cup, his first one. We lost in the semi. Because there is a transition from going to a small rink to a big rink. Even though a half a dozen of us had played ball hockey, too, it's still a different game. Then by... 79, we'd been doing all this travel, going to Long Island, going down to Pennsylvania, and I uh, had a good core of guys that followed uh, us where we went. We put a tour together, and we went from Niagara Falls all the way to 
11 cities, and, and then we ended up in Moncton, our 12th city. We played in the Canada Cup again in 79. One game we would play ball hockey rules, one game we would play street hockey rules. The irony of the whole thing is, is that we beat the Ontario champions in Oshawa. We uh, we lost to the uh, world, what they call the Canada champions in Ottawa, and then we beat Ottawa playing their rules. We lost playing our rules, and then we played Ottawa in um, in the Canada Cup in Moncton, and we beat them playing their rules, and they were Canada champs. We lost again in the semi. We were close, but that was uh, 16 days on the road, 11, 11 games, and then 12, three more games in the tournament. So we played uh, 15 games total in uh, 17 days. And uh, some places in Hull, Quebec, they call it uh, Gatineau. And uh, we drew 7,000 fans for the game. And we would get half the gate, enough money to keep moving. We had a bus. It was like, you know, if you could think of the Magic Mystery Tour bus just driving from Lemister to Niagara Falls and then moving along and, and uh, 20 guys in a bus with a with a half a dozen ball boys and a bus driver that was as crazy as you could find. That was our trip. But that helped us get a lot of teams to come back to us. We went to these tournaments again. And then that's what really got the Rams going was, uh, you know, me personally, I like to play hockey and I grew up playing it. And uh, so I wasn't idle too long where I'd say, Hey, let's go here. Let's go there. Like, so when I give you an example is by 86, when, 85, I mean, when we started with the Quebec guys, I, I got our teams to start going to Quebec City. And then that lasted until about, like, 91, we were going into Montreal. By 93 and 94, we were down in uh, Fort Worth and Dallas, Texas. So, and then by 97, we were in Vegas. But as you get older, you know, like somebody like myself, and that you can't play and you got more kids, up to three or four kids at that point, you have to, it's hard to it's hard to invest your time, run a business, play as much hockey as you did when you were younger. You know, it's into my into my mid forties by that time. So the, keeping the Rams going was important because we could call on a lot of different local guys and put a shirt on, and go somewhere, and you know uh, whether I was playing or coaching the team, our mission was always the same: go into the tournament, try to show them the best possible way we could play. If we win, we win. If we don't, that's, for example, in 84, Mark Madden had, uh, he got a tournament at the Igloo, lots of attention, all kinds of paper, and he's in the newspaper business too, but a lot of fans came to that game, and that's right away after that, all that tournament happened, Penn Hills happened, and and sometimes that's what would happen with the tournament, half the same in Quebec, the attention would say, hey, we should have this in our neighborhood, and kids could be playing it. And we were always pushing to get kids down to these tournaments. And that, that's a whole other level of, uh, you know, development. Ball hockey and deck hockey have seen rapid growth in recent years, but it pales in comparison to the number of teams participating back in the 80s. Yeah. I look at, again, I'm looking at teams here from, there used to be the Canadians, Quorum from Quorum, New York. Uh, like there was the King Hawks from Holbrook, New York. Then you had uh, Lancers from Miller Place, New York. You had the Titans from New Jersey. You had the Jets from one, is it Wonton, New York? Look at all the teams from all the different areas of, of just one state that you used to have participating. Now I think you can almost count. I mean, like when I was playing, even at Hockey Town, you had 30, 40 teams. You're lucky if you got 16 teams up there now. And, and they're all from one area, you know? But all these traveling teams, Pennsylvania, Niagara Falls, Franks, <laughs> Um, TUM, Murray's team from Niagara Falls. There were so many good teams out there. The yep. Wizards from Pennsylvania. Uh, that's what I think needs to get back in the game. There needs to be more teams. You know, you don't want to go like have the Little League World Series and call it a national championship with six teams there. No. I, I think it has to be, they got to grow it where there's more pioneers or more kids that yeah. can field teams that get a chance to win. And I think you'll see more teams coming. Well, yeah, you, I think, know, I, you know what one problem is, Dan? Seriously. There aren't obsessed lunatics anymore like me, you, and Ray. That's the truth, those are, yeah. Those are few and far between. I, hey, Team Pittsburgh, you know, the team that's great now, the gods, uh, they're great for a lot of reasons. But one is Corey Hurst, their coach, is A, a great coach, and B, an obsessed lunatic. He makes yeah. it such a big part of his life, and you need more people like that, and I don't think there's many of those left. No. 
It was, oh, that's the same way. That's the same way it is in South Jersey. There's the guys that are still running everything are the guys that played in the late seventies, eighties. Chris Kaplan, they're the guys that are still keeping it going. You know, yep, there's not a lot of rinks around here. And when we had our league, we had forty teams in our league, and we would send you know five, six teams would go to Lemonster. They right. seventy eight when the Kings won standard. Uh, beat the Woodland Raiders in the semifinals. If Woodland would have won, it would have been the two teams that played in the South Jersey finals that year, playing for the national championship in Lemonster. You know, right. so you had the teams that were there, and now, like you said, it's still the old diehards that are keeping it going. Well, you look back at the tournaments, and how about the the Nationals and the International when you used to play seven games in three days to win a championship? Exactly. Yeah. Like, Ninety yeah. degree heat in Lemonster, boy, I'll tell you. And that was like. That was Dan. That was like two, three weeks apart. We played the national oh my. the first week in May, then the international right after, and that was like. So you had to be an athlete. You had to really be an athlete to do that. Nationals was what we called second round elimination. All the tournaments were like that for years. You played yeah, a single elimination, yeah. and then if you lost, you played a winner. If you won, you played a loser. But no matter what, if you lost your second game, you were out. That right. was nationals. Internationals, Ray, they had that always had Ron Robin, right? Ron Robin, four games guaranteed. Right, exactly. You'd have a division, A, B, C, D. You could you'd always have a Canadian team in your division. Right. Chris would try and they would try to separate the team, the local teams, put them all in a division. But you, that tournament in the international, which is what six games to win, I think three and Seven, usually eight. one Friday, two Saturday, three Sunday. Yeah, you played you played two Saturday, two Sunday, and three Monday. For the, so you had quarter semis finals on Monday. So you played seven games in three days. And that's played, right, in the international. And you played at the top level. You played – so when you look, think about it, you look at it and say, man, we were, we were athletes. Oh, my God, to play yeah. seven games at, at 100%. You went full tilt for seven games because if, if you lost on Monday, you were gone. So to win it all, you played seven games. And, that's right. Oh, my God. Well, you, you, you might say we were athletes. But Dan Frank McNally made it through that. Who? I tell you. Well, Frank that's why we. That's why the national was was our probably. We only played I think four finals in the national, and uh, that was our worst tournament. I remember Bobby Taylor used to always say to me, "We go out there." He says, "Do you have the money for the international with you?" I says, "Why?" Because he says, "You know, we're getting knocked out of the national in the second game. <laughs> <laughs> you might as well pay Chris now." <laughs> <laughs> We could not win that tournament no matter what we did. I don't know what it was, but the International, the Can-Am, uh, that was anything that was around Robin. Because you know you're always going to have a bad game. But right. that National, I'm telling you, we could lose to, you know, yeah. uh, St. Francis of Assisi in the second game. We, that's how, that, it was just a bad luck tournament for us. In the 1980s, the rules differ from what we see today. But the passion, the rivalries, and the events were at an all-time high. Everybody hated Corum. Yep. Yeah, I was just going to say that. I still do. Uh, everybody hated Franks from Niagara Falls. Yep. Those were Montreal probably, Flames. <laughs> yeah, Montreal Flames, but they weren't there as often. Uh, Corum was there every tournament. Uh, yeah. Franks were there fairly often. I remember one time at internationals, Chris asked me if I could ref a few games. So I go out to ref a game. It's Franks versus Corum. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, boy. That, that's like the Axis powers against each other. And yep. I'm going to be honest, about three minutes in, after a goal, I went to the center dot to drop it. I looked at both centers. I go, from here on out, you're both on your own. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, they were. Ooh. If they were going to play that way, they were going to have to sort it out among themselves. Yeah. East Boston Outlaws, where they were, they could give you a few good whacks. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, New Bedford had some chippy teams there for, I think, a little bit. Yeah, they did. Yes, they did. Yeah. But, but uh, everybody hated Corum. And, and I'm not knocking them. They were a very good team. And that hate fueled them. That hate, <laughs> they, they loved that hate. They were like pro wrestling heels. They, <laughs> they got off on that and, and probably prostered because of it. Yeah. Well, there was there was some tough teams up in the falls up there too, Ray, weren't they? Well, you had um, – some of those teams that could really brawl if yeah. you got ahead of them with the tie cats and a few, some yeah. of those other teams were, yeah. <laughs> they yeah. were not fun to play with. No, they were not fun to play with. No, they were not. It was like, I remember one time we took a team from, we took uh, the North Shore Knights up there. Oh my God. Me and Willis flew up. The rest of them took like a 12 hour drive on a, on one of those yellow school buses. 
good luck. We flew into the Buffalo, went over in a cart, and we ended up playing a team from some team in Niagara Falls, and one of the guy's wives jumped over the boards, and she got where well, she fell, and she got kicked so hard, a, a brawl broke out. We had to get rid of the, the game was canceled in like the second period. I forget the name of the team we played. I don't know if it was TVR or somebody. Uh, somebody different from them. Oh my God, that was. I, I, I said, what the hell are we doing here? <laughs> Man, I remember. Remember we won the tournament in Buffalo. We beat the Thai Cats in the final. You and Chris played for us. Yes. Yep. We we took well. It was like it was like a wizard Seahawks. Just anybody who could go, like Ted Long, Chris Haas, or you, Dougie. And I remember we played the Thai Cats in the final, and they came out and used you know did their usual crap. Yeah. And I remember we scored on the first two power plays, and then after that they said, ah, we we don't want to lose the game, and we wound up winning in overtime. But you had to score on those teams on the power play, or they would just kill you physically, kill you. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean they, they were big, you know, old Tajo. And they had, uh, oh. of course, they had a great player there, too, and Jared Scaldi, who played with uh, Las Vegas um, in the AHL, right? He was a tremendous player for oh, that money. He for Atlanta in the NHL. He got about 100 NHL games. His dad. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Scott, I'll tell you the one thing that we enjoyed more than anything when we were able to play, we played against an awful lot of NHL guys. Yeah. Uh, whether it was Ludzik in the Falls or Steve Larmer or Osborne, Mark Osborne, um, Frank Petrangelo was a goalie up there. Um, then you had Lemister. You had um, Brian Noonan would play for Southie. Uh Rick Middleton played one year for a team from Lowell with Steve Hines. Yep, yep. Um, yeah, yeah. We played against Jimmy Waite. Uh, I remember we played Patrick Kawar yeah, up we in did. Montreal. Yeah, yeah, and he was a forward. He came, he came here and played too, down here. Yeah. And Guy Carbonell. Key Cabernet, yeah, all those guys, yeah. Well, Chris was mentioned on the story. We played the we played Roy's team in the the semifinal up there, and Cabernet won the faceoff, and he mm -hmm. went to shoot it around the boards. He shot it right in the short side of his goalie, and we beat them six <laughs> five. Yeah. He scored it, scored on his own goalie, yes. Yeah. But, but yeah. Mark Wa Wa played out, correct? And, and yes. he ran he ran his team. Well, yeah, here's, here's a great Patrick yes, he Wah played, story. Played forward. Yep. And Patrick Wa used to uh, bring a team to Lemonster quite a bit. And uh, he would have the LeBeau brothers, who were the Canadians, uh, Jean-Jacques Daniel. Jimmy Wade played goal as Wall played out. Uh, I thought LeBeau brothers were among the two of the better deck hockey players I've ever seen. But yeah. we went to the Quebec tournament once. Uh, Dan, I went with the Seahawks. You remember that. And uh, I remember talking to Wall up there. Because Wall at these tournaments for deck hockey was very accessible. He was very yes. approachable, just a nice guy, yes. a great ambassador exactly. for the game. And I said to him, Patrick, and I think he played defense, actually. I said, Patrick, why do you play defense? Why don't you play goal? And he, and he says, you know what the French ask? He goes, well, you know. He goes, if I play goal, then at some point, the guy who worked at the convenience score, score a goal on me in the league. And then I have to hear that goal for the rest of my life. Exactly. So I play defense. Exactly. Exactly. He was, uh, he was a character. And um, it was tremendous. Uh, a lot of great memories. And all the years we – Traveled. I, I tell anybody now that if you get a chance to travel, play in deck hockey, see the world, whether it's in the States or Canada or Europe, go. You know, because it's, it's something you never forget. And that concludes part two of our five-part series, the 1980s, the golden age of deck hockey. We'd like to thank everybody for the trip down memory lane and the nostalgia that the 80s brought. Coming up next is part three, the 1990s. Scott, what can we look forward to? So part three is going to cover the 1990s. We have a, another great panel of guests. Most importantly, we have Mark Madden back again and Jay Machen, who are probably two of the sport's biggest personalities. And they're going to take us through a decade that's filled with super teams that are highly skilled rivalries that pushed our sport to the brink. And you'll see a game that looks very different than what you see today, a, a much more physical style of play that, you know, that sometimes even spilled over outside the rink.